I want to begin this morning by letting you know that I am so proud of you. Church, yesterday you went into our community and you you put feet and hands to what it means to leave this building and take the message of Jesus to people who may never would step foot in here. That's what the church is. The church is, is us who have Christ in us moving to a place where there's darkness. Yesterday, you became salt and light. And I'm so proud of you. Uh, Ashley and Lauren, you guys did an amazing job putting things together. I I am proud of you um, because you rallied an entire church to a point of obedience. And, And just like whenever you go and you put seeds in the garden or in the field, we may not see the harvest yet, but it's coming. And the more obedient we are to work the fields like he has told us to, the greater the harvest we'll see. Um, I I just want you to know that yesterday was one of those days as I I looked out and saw everybody working, uh, I I couldn't help just to be proud of a part of the, to be a part of this church. You guys are great. Um, This morning, we're going to go back to Colossians chapter 3. I did my very best to to give this message last week, and well, it just didn't happen. So we'll give it a noble attempt this week. You've got in your bulletins an insert that has a hand because that hand is a reminder that we are supposed to put several things on. Just like a glove, you and I struggle to put these things on. It's, it's almost not natural for us to do this because we're learning who we are in Christ. And it's easy to live without this kind of stuff if we're not careful. Go to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14. Again, we had been looking at the names of Christ and the titles of Christ. This, this title comes out of Christ is love, and because, he has, because he's love, what, how does this change my Monday? Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you or forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's pray. God, this morning, as we look at this passage in Colossians, I know that Christ is love. Because of that, I also know that you call us to display love. And this is really, really hard sometimes. It's even harder to display love the way you define it. Because often I wish I could. This morning as we go through this text, Lord, I'm just asking that your spirit really would have free reign in this place this morning. I ask that you would arrest our hearts and our minds so that we're only captured by you and your thoughts. We need you now more than ever if we're going to live like Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just going to quickly give you the points of the previous message so that we can move on hastily. Because Christ is love, I must put on these things that are totally unnatural for me to have in my life. That's the put on part. 
Because Christ is love, I must get my hands dirty with other people's needs. That's the have compassion. You showed compassion yesterday when you were hands and feet. Because Christ is love, I must be kind. This means that you share what is really needed with soothing help and you avoid all unnecessary harshness. I will say, whenever it is in the mid-90s outside, typically that's when tempers flare. You guys did a great job. I didn't have to pull anybody apart yesterday. Thank you. Because Christ is love, I must see myself accurately and express my need for him. This is humility. He says, we have to have humility when we serve. And then we get to today's part of the message. And after humility, he says that we have to have gentleness. Because because Christ is love, I must be gentle. Now, the text does not say, because Christ is love, I have to be a doormat. That's not what gentleness means. And I'll tell you, I have struggled with this my whole life because I, 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 I'm a big guy and I've been involved in sports growing up. And there was always this tension of, well, I don't want to break people. Quite literally, I broke two legs when I was a kid in football uh, of, of, of people I played. And so, so because of that, I, I kind of backed off and, and I, I became a big pud. And when you play football, being a pud's not really a quality you want. And there's always this tension inside us. But he says to be gentle, and it doesn't mean that you're a doormat. What that means is that you are controlled passion. Gentleness does not remove passion and fire from your life. It simply means that it's under control. And so when he tells us to be gentle, you're you're talking about Paul, who had a tendency to go off on people, and I would give a week's paycheck if I could go back and have one of those recorded. I would have loved to have seen him tee off on Peter. But here's the man writing this that says, you need to have gentleness. Some of you in this room, God has given much fire in your belly. I think he put it there. I think the Lord put it there. But I think he put it there for it to be controlled also. Directed passion. So that your fire is beneficial, not hurtful. That's what he tells us with gentleness. Now we're just kind of cruising right along here. And the next is he says... Because Christ is love, I must be patient. Oh, that one hurts. He says that we are to have patience. Now, patience here is long passion or long suffering. It means that it takes you a long time to come uncorked. That's what patience is. Patience in life means that you're not walking around with a short fuse. Now, that would, that would seem to encompass a lot of stuff. And, and so, for some reason, Paul, when he wrote this, thought it necessary to clarify what patience is. I, I, I want to... I want to just pause right here and I want to illustrate what I'm about to say, okay? This morning for breakfast, I had corn, whole grain wheat, sugar, 
whole grain rolled oats, brown sugar, almonds, rice, canola oil, wheat flour, malted barley flour, because it's not beer, that's just an ingredient. Corn syrup, salt, whey, malted corn and barley syrup, wild flour, honey, caramel color, cinnamon, natural and artificial flavor. And that toe ex extract, it's a color. And I had a little bit of BHT. That was added to the packaging to, to keep the product fresh. That's what I had for breakfast this morning. The other way to describe it is, is to say that I had honey bunches of oats <laughs> with almonds. I had honey bunches of oats with almonds. <laughs> but this is another way of saying it, okay? So here, you can, see, you can see my honey bunches of oats with almonds. I tell you this because participles are some of my favorite new things. I love participles. Participles in grammar tell you the ingredients because there's a, a, a big product that has been described that you and I are supposed to make. Let's say somebody came in to you and said, hey, guess what? Next week we're about to have a big party. I need, to make, I need you to make some honey bunches of oats for our party. If you didn't know this, you, you, you wouldn't know to put DHT in there. I say this because these are the things that went into this. In participle speaking, the, Paul gives us right here, he says, you are to have patience. Now I'm going to give you some participles to tell you what goes into patience. Because if I don't give you participles to tell you what goes into patience, you're going to be left to try to figure out what patience is on your own. So listen to the text because he's about to give us, using participles, the recipe for patience. Bearing with each other. Yours may say bear, bearing, that is a participle. That means it's an ingredient that goes into it. Bearing, I, because Christ is love, I must bear with each other. This means that we have completed a process together. There's been a necessary sequence and in the end, we are both still standing. So, what am I supposed to bear? <laughs> it depends. For some of us, it may just be bearing the fact that someone else is with us. It may sound silly, but I've told you before, Matthew, the tax collector, was in the same room with Simon the Zealot, also known as a terrorist who hated Roman traitors. Matthew was working for Rome as a Jew. And I believe whenever Paul gives this in his letter, he's looking back and he's thinking about Jesus and his disciples because Paul had interviewed them. And, and, and you see one of the marks of following Christ because of his love is the fact that you can bear one another. There may be people in this room that in the fleshly world you would absolutely love to hate. And Jesus says, because of his love, 
kill that. Bearing one another also means that when someone's going through something, they don't go through it alone. It says bear with one another. You may need to go through a process with someone. There's people in this room who have hurts and fears and loss and sufferings and joys, and they should not do this alone. Because as the body of Christ, it's our job to bear with one another. So let me say this, how do you bear with one another if you don't know one another? Guys, I'll tell you, coming here for the worship service and for Sunday school, I've said before, we can feign a smile. We just pass each other, barely rubbing elbows. That doesn't let one another know what we're going through. Because Christ is love, I have to know you well enough to know what's going on in your life which means we have to spend time together so that we can bear with one another. This is one of those harsh realities that if you're in here and no one is bearing something with you, Have you allowed them to get close enough to you so that they can bear with you? Because I know in this room, there are people with big enough hearts who want to do ministry with you and to you. They just don't know your needs. We are a church family, which means we have to grow as a family. We have to know each other so that we can bear with one another. And here comes, here comes the kick in the gut. You ready for this? Here's the other ingredient in patience. He says, forgive whatever grievance you have against one another. Oh. Oh. Forgive. Many of us don't like that word to forgive. Well, if you don't like the word to forgive, you're probably not going to like this because the New Testament uses several different words for forgive. The one that we most often think about is to put something away, okay? So here's part of my breakfast. You see it now, right? You don't see it right now, right? Because I've put it out of sight. I've put it away. That's one definition of forgive, means you've put it away, it's gone. That's not the word that's used here. Here's the word that's used in this text. It is the word to bestow a favor unconditionally. He's talking to a church here and he says, I want you to go beyond just putting away what someone's done to you. I want you in the face of what they've done to bestow a favor to them unconditionally. I want you not only to not hold on to what they've done to you, I want you to be a blessing in their life with no strings attached. Guys, that's hard because our world is full of strings. I'll do something for you if you'll do something for me. We'll scratch each other's back. And this text says, if you want to show the love of Christ, cut the strings, be a blessing, even if they don't deserve it or want it. It's hard. Because that means that now 
those people who we want to be resentful to and who have so hurt us, it's now time for us to look for ways that they praise God when they see us because we bless them. Now, I said that we do that because Jesus is love. Has he shown that? You bet he has. He hung on a cross just like that to forgive the sins of mankind. Does everyone deserve it? Absolutely not. Does anyone deserve it? No way. Is this a blessing beyond anything we could imagine? Yes, because it is the way to the Father. It's the only way to the Father. Will everyone accept it? No, because some people don't want his forgiveness. Therefore, he has blessed even if people don't want it. That's the unconditional part. He doesn't say, I'm going to die for your sins only if you'll accept me. He says that he has died for all. And that is the model that we as believers must take. So I wonder, are we willing to forgive people as long as it's on our terms? He says in the next part of this, because Christ is love, I must forgive as the Lord forgave me. He says in the text, forgive as the Lord forgave you. This means to the same degree, in the same kind, in the same manner that he forgave you, you and I are to forgive one another. I was thinking, okay, how did the Lord forgive? Well, he forgave at a high cost to himself. He forgave instantly. If you'll recall, when he died on the cross, the curtain was split in two. It wasn't a process. See, here's, here's kind of how sometimes we think about forgiveness. Okay, I'm going to let my my anger simmer down for a few months. I just won't talk to them. Then the next process is maybe I'll be able to look at them and not say anything inappropriate. And maybe in a couple of years, I'll pull myself to say hello. But you can forget ever wanting to be a blessing. That's a process. Jesus didn't forgive like this. Oh, I hate them today. I'm going to smite them to hell for their sins. Maybe I'll just be silent for a while. Maybe one day I can pull myself to tell my creation, hello, but I'll never forgive them. No, he sent his son in the matter of a few moments on a cross, it was all done. It was also done indiscriminately. I said a moment ago, he died for all mankind. Whether or not you have chosen to accept his forgiveness, he died for you. That offering is on the table. It's a gift with your name on it, whether you take it or not. And that's how he expects us to forgive. The offer's on the table. I'm going to bless you whether you accept the forgiveness or not. Guys, I know that this is weighty stuff. And this is where I just want to kind of, to get a little personal with this, let you see kind of how God deals with me in study time. I've been going over this text this week, been reading through it. I, I've not wanted to, I've not wanted to deal with forgiveness and bearing because I'll just tell you, there's people that I don't want to forgive in life and there's some people that I don't want to bear with. I just want to 
eat them. Because I may be a pastor, but I'm, I'm human. I'm not perfect. And, and so I've been wrestling through this text even up to this morning. And, and I've been studying God's word simultaneously with several others each day. And God brings us to a, a text. And it is amazing when you're studying his word, he gives you exactly what you need at the moment you need it. And this morning I was in First Peter. In in First Peter chapter two. Verse eleven. He says this, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. As I was reading this, I couldn't help but, but to think of a picture that I had seen years ago. Kim, could you please put that picture up? Because this isn't a political statement, okay? Please don't take it this way. Our president did not grow up in Texas on a farm. He didn't. He grew up in Chicago. As a kid, he was in Hawaii, Indonesia, Chicago. Not a farm. I, I could use a bunch of illustrations of this, but this is the picture that, that just flashed in my mind. And, and I couldn't help but to think whenever I, I, I remembered this picture, that is a photo op if I have ever seen one. He was trying to target a certain group of people. And so the hat, and, and guys, I... I I'm in the same boat, guys. I don't live on a farm. I live in a neighborhood. The only thing that eats my grass is worms. I, I have no cows. I have no horses. I have no sheep or donkeys or goats or anything like that. I, I've, I've, I've got bushes and a soccer goal. And so for me to put on a cowboy hat and, and a big old belt buckle would be just as alien because that's not me and, and, and I show you this because I'm guessing some of you as soon as you saw this probably went oh and guys I can't help but to wonder if my God doesn't look at me and think the same thing Listen to the text right above what I just read to you this morning. In verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Guys, when we put on sin... When we clothe ourselves in the world's passions, when we clothe ourselves in sinfulness, God looks at us and says, that's Bert Span. The sinfulness that you've clothed yourself in, that's not you, Bert. Look at verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. So would you please, Bert, get out of that sinfulness? That's not you. So this morning... Here's what I must ask. When we look at that bearing, that, that forgiving one another, 
as Christ has forgiven us? Are we willing to clothe ourselves in the kind of love that God has said that describes you, not sinfulness? Because if you're unwilling to forgive, if you're unwilling to bear with one another, then you are a dime store cowboy. You're wearing a costume that does not belong to you. Your real home, your real residence is in the heavenlies with Christ. You are a new creation. Creation. The old is gone, the new has come. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that we are the righteousness of God. Therefore, we must not clothe ourselves in unforgiveness and not bearing with one another. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. I'm going to guess that one of the last things that any of us want to be in here is a fraud. None of us wants that label. None of us wants to be known as something other than what we really are. And according to this text, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're new. We follow his model of love. We bear we forgive. We're kids of the King. And so this morning, if there's any unforgiveness in your heart, if there's someone in your life that right now tension defines you, not blessing, then it is high time that you confess those sins, repent, and change. Part of the invitation times means not only getting things right with God, but getting things right with one another. And so in a few moments when we have a time where we sing, if you need to go have things made right with someone else, do not leave this place in a dime store cowboy outfit. Get things right between you and others. Lord, we carry your name. We're Christ carriers. Which means the world out there is looking and so is the world in here and and I ask that you would shape us into the likeness of Christ. Forgive us when we have not lived as aliens and strangers. God, we know our home is with you. Help us to live like that. I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.